I, I'm convinced that when a third of the angels were cast out of heaven, that about half of them went into the sound systems of all the churches. Yeah. Good morning. It's nice to be here. My name is Jim Lockwood. Uh, and as you can tell from my accent that I'm a North American, but I trust you're not going to hold that against me. Now. I appreciate Pastor Cecil for offering this opportunity. Amen. It's been a while since I've, I've done this in front of an adult audience, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And uh, I just want to thank you, and I want to thank you, the worship team, because they bring us into the presence of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Not all worship teams do. <laughs> Hello. But it's good to be here. Uh, again, my name is Jim Lockwood. I'm a citizen of America, I'm a citizen of Canada, I'm a permanent resident of South Africa, and I've spent probably over 20 years in South Africa. I'm married to a Burmese. My mama didn't raise a fool, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, I have a South African wife um, who's going through a difficult time right now, but uh, we have the victory. Amen? It's a blessing to share the Word of God this morning, and uh, let's just let's just ask the Lord to help us this yeah. morning. There's an old hymn that I love so much, More, More About Jesus. Yeah. Is that your expectation this morning? Yes. That, that we're going to learn more and more about Jesus. Amen. And even though I'm going into the Old Testament, He's the Word made flesh. Yeah. I mean, he's the author of the whole book. Isn't it wonderful that we've got the only religion where the author of the whole thing comes to every service? Yes. Because he's here. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's here. Yeah. you got to believe here. that. And, and if you believe that, let, let's pray this prayer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something I don't usually do repeat after me. Uh, but there's a verse in that hymn that goes, Spirit of God. Can you say that? Spirit yeah. of God. Spirit of God. My teacher be. My teacher be showing the things, showing the things of Christ to me. Of Christ to me. And we thank you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. For illuminating your word this morning. For illuminating your word this morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, my part in the body of Christ is the pinky. I'm, I'm a teacher. My calling is as a teacher. Um, I was a government school teacher in Canada for about 12 years, and then God got a hold of me. And I've been involved in Christian education since 1979, so you can okay. figure that one out. And I still am. Yeah. I'm ministering over at Hermanus Christian Academy on a regular basis. I'm a, I'm a pastor in a sense to children. And, and don't take it personally, but I'd much rather deal with children than adults. <laughs> you, you probably don't know, but that's my call. Yeah. You know? And they're far more forgiving than we adults are, did you know? I gave my heart to Christ in 1977. He apprehended me, and he moved me out of the whole government education thing into Christian education. But I just want to say that from the time I was born again, I've had some wonderful mentors. God was so gracious to me and, and, and my late wife to, to bring mentors into our lives immediately to, to really steer us into the things of the kingdom of God instead of church Eanic. Can somebody say amen to that? Yeah. You know, so I, I learned early on the difference between religion and relationship. And, and that's so important. You know, but we also have we also have mentors in the Word of God. And we've got to remember that. And you know, we're we're getting closer. I look around, a lot of baby boomers here. I'm a pre-baby boomer, but uh, we should be thinking about our eternal rest. Yeah. And you know, th these people we meet in the Bible, these are real people. And I've had some wonderful um, mentors. And I think perhaps my favorite one of all, and he he's more of a mentor to me all the time as I grow older, you know, is Caleb, okay? And, and I, I know we've probably all heard a lot of preaching about Caleb. You know, we, we know some amazing things about him. You know, what, what an overcomer he was. And, and when you really study his life deeply, you find out what an amazing overcomer he was from his youth on right up to the time 
Uh, he was 85 and, and did the, the greatest things that, that he achieved in his whole life. Yeah. But he was 85. You know, Psalm 37, 5, it's very important. It says, commit your way unto the Lord. Have you done that? No. I mean, commit your way. It says about Caleb, he followed God with a whole heart. Yes. He was holy, yeah. holy, following God his whole life. Wow. You know, that's someone to emulate. You know, we're told in 1 Corinthians 10, Romans 15, I think, that, that their examples given to us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Do you believe that we're living at that time? Hello, wave to me. Hey, we're, we're in this exciting time. We're, we're in the end of the ages. And, and he gives us these examples for our admonition. You know, we don't like to be admonished sometimes. But, but I, I trust this morning we're all going to be admonished a bit. Yeah. So fasten your seatbelt, okay? And, and it, it's for our admonition, just like a prophet is for our admonition, our comfort, our edification. Amen. And, and that's what I've gained from the life of Caleb. Yeah. He, he's been a great mentor. And, and think of this. I'm going to be with him in heaven for yeah. eternity. Man, I'm going to sit down with these guys and really ask them some questions because I've kind of surmised some things about their lives. But, you know, I, I don't know totally. No, I, I told her her name. She's, she's going to wave at me because they're, they're, <laughs> they're doing the communion this morning. And, and I can carry on, you know. And they and I like to talk together. <laughs> we got lots of stories. But I, I want to get into this. Now, the story of Caleb, he, he, he's an amazing overcomer. And if you want to know how to overcome, look at the life of an overcomer, right? Yeah. Oswald Chambers said something I read the other day. The overcoming life is not given by God. Okay? The overcoming life doesn't just drop down from heaven. The overcoming, he gives us life and life abundantly, listen to this, as we overcome. As we overcome. And, and, and as we approach you know, our latter years, <laughs> you know, um, we're going to have more and more challenges. Do you understand that? Yeah. We're, not, we're not all going to be like Moses, who ended up on the mountain, he was 120, was fit as a fit. No, it's not going to be like that for some. We're all going to go through some really challenges. But he who overcomes the Lord says, yeah. will I make, will I make. And then if you read in Revelation, all seven churches, yeah. Man, the stuff we get if we overcome. He that endures to the end. end. And if there's ever a guy in the Bible who endured until the end, it was Caleb, our friend. Okay? Now, again, the story is big. I put scriptures up here because I would really challenge you in, in the coming week just to read his story and think about it. You know, it says Selah, you know, in, in scripture in the, in the King James. That means pause and think about it but there's there's another word that's used sometimes it's called hideo it, it, it's it's a word Greek word that means meditate on it. Mm. you know chew the cut <laughs> mm. think about it. the things i tell you today get in there and, and do some searching yourself because he who seeks will find and when god gives you a personal revelation there's nothing more exciting isn't that true amen it's not something you read in a book or, you know, heard in the sermon, but when God drops something into your heart and mind, it's like, whoa, God speaks. This is wonderful. Amen? That's one of the greatest experiences I've had as a Christian is when God has spoken to me clearly, not just for the body of Christ and for children, but for myself and my, you know, my own development, my admonition. If, if you look at number 13, the first thing we find out, you don't have to turn there, I'll, I'll tell you. It's, it's got a list, God, God says to Moses in Numbers 13, verse 1, I want you to select 12 headmen, one from each tribe, leaders, headmen. And, and if you go down to verse 6, you, you'll see that for the tribe of Judah, which was the largest tribe, right, he chose Caleb. 
And it says this. I, I, I'm a curious guy. I don't know. It says, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. And pastor, I asked myself, what is a Kenizzite? I don't know. What, I know what an Edomite is. I know what a Moabite, an Ammonite, but I've never heard of the Kenizzites. Who are they? I found out that the Kenaz was a grandson of Esau. Hello? He was a grandson of Esau, which made Caleb an Edomite. You know, descended from Esau, the man of flesh, the man who sold his birthright, the man who didn't get the blessing, you know? And, and some wicked people were Edomites. I mean, Herod the Great, guess what? He wasn't an Israelite, he was an Edomite. Mm -hmm. and, and so somehow we don't know that some of these Edomites were in Canaan land, in the land of Goshen, maybe during the time of the famine at Joseph's time, and, and there's, there's archaeological evidence of that. And, and we know that a mixed multitude went with Israel out, you know. And, and so what I'm telling you is that Caleb was a slave, but he, had, he hitched his wagon to the tribe of Judah somehow. And he was so, I mean, he'd seen the, the ten plagues and everything. He was so holy after God. He was so strong in his faith. He was so strong in his commitment that the biggest tribe of Israel chose him to be their head man. There is a guy who changed his destiny. Again, Psalm 37, 5, commit your way unto the Lord. He did that. And then it says, trust also in him. Then you commit yourself totally to God. You're going to have to trust because you're going to go through some stuff. Amen? If you're sold out totally, totally, wholeheartedly to God, you're going to go through some persecution. You're going to go through all kinds of stuff. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I hope I have time. And um, it says this. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also Him, and He shall bring it to pass. And I, I read that scripture uh, a lot, uh, even in our school. It's, it's in, a, in the school books that... Psalm 37, 5. And then the Lord asked me, what's it? Hello? He will bring it to pass. What's it? It's our destiny. Yeah. Amen? God has a plan, a purpose, and a dust destiny for us. We can frustrate it. We can refuse it. But Caleb is a guy who never did. And his destiny in life was to go to the town that was called Kiriath Arba, the city of Arba. Now, Arba was the greatest giant of them all, okay? He was, he was the father of Anak, uh, who was the father of the Anakim, you know, the giants. So we have a race of giants. Now, Caleb had seen these guys when he was, you know, a spy in the land. And you know the story. I don't want to go into all that. I just assume, if you don't know the story, just read these scriptures. Yeah. But you've heard a lot of sermons about the ten and the, and the two. I'll, I'll just say this. I'll just say this. An unanointed seer, you know, mm. describes the mess this world's in. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And we got lots of those. <laughs> mm. I mean, mainstream media is, is like the Hittites. That they're to bring fear into our hearts. You know? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. An unanointed seer just describes the way things are. An anointed seer, an anointed seer describes things the way God sees yeah. them. Amen. Amen. And, and that was Cain. He said, yeah, everything they said is true. I saw the same thing. But, you know, God said, yes, they're going to be a might seven mightier nations than we are. They're going to have strong cities. They're going to they're be stronger and everything. But God said. Mm. You know, he, he didn't ask them to come back as 12 spies and decide whether to go or not. But we have unanointed seers 
in the world today, and, and the sign of it is that they bring fear into the hearts of God's people. Yeah. Caleb even said, look, these guys, these ten, they made the hearts of our people melt, you know, and give up. You know how many Christians there are around the world that their hearts have melted and they've given up and they've allowed the spirit of fear that God, you know, promises. I do not give you that. You know, he promises. We've got to believe God. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And his destiny was to be fulfilled because of his faith and his overcoming ability. Now, I, I don't want to go too much into what he experienced, but after the ten, the ten spies had their way, the majority committed. Yeah. And never decide things by committee, by the way, Pastor. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> you know, Moses should have known that. But um, they were doomed to 40 years in the wilderness, and, and Caleb had to hang out with the church of doubt and unbelief for 40 years. Can you imagine that? That was the biggest challenge of his life, I'm sure. And I think he occupied himself, like I've occupied myself, with training up the next generation, you know. If this generation ain't going to make it, then we've got to find one that will. And it's our responsibility to impart unto them. Read Psalm 71. David said, now I'm, I'm old and gray, Lord. Don't take me out until I have imparted to the next generation and even the one after that, our kids, our grandkids. I've got three great-grandkids. Impart unto them the power and the glory and the majesty of Almighty God. Can someone say amen? That's yeah. a good place to say amen. amen. That's our responsibility. And so that was his destiny. Now, I'll move along here because these three names of the giants are important. Hebron was a city called Kiriath Arba, the city of Arba. And, and yet, Hebron, I'll say Hebron. That's better. Caleb was the one that named it Hebron. He was the one that changed the name. When he did that, we're not quite sure. But Hebron has meaning. It means place of alliance. Place, place of alliance, where we come, place of fellowship. I guess a modern Greek word would be koinonia. Ever hear yeah. that one before? Yeah. Koinonia. True fellowship as the family of God. And, and ecclesia, the church, has been very deficient in that. Mm. And there's reasons for that. So he, he wanted to be the place of alliance. And I'll get this in quickly. 250 years later, when King Saul went down, Judah chose David to be their new king, but he was only the king over Judah. And where was he king? He was king at Hebron. That was his capital city. And through Caleb, prophetically, God was preparing a whole history. You understand? What we do counts. What we do and say and, and, and relate uh, counts for time and eternity. None of it is lost on God, for better or for worse, okay? And so David became king in Hebron, and I'm telling you, those tribes, those tell, they had some issues. They really did. I mean, at one time, the tribe of Benjamin was almost eliminated. You know, I mean, they had some real issues, but in the seven years that David was there, they worked it out. He was kind of a, a type of Christ, you know. And, and when they came into true Koinonia then, then it was time to move their capital, and all the tribes came and acknowledged, not just Judah, all the tribes acknowledged him as their king. So he united all of Israel, and they moved from Hebron, the place of alliance, Koinonia, to Jerusalem, the place of peace. Amen? And, and, and we're not going to experience, I mean, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. But in the church, the ecclesia universal, until we come into true koinonia and unity, we're, we're not going to see that peace. Amen? And, and Satan is trying everything he can to divide us on every issue possible. Do you believe that? Yeah. So Caleb's an old guy. He's 85. Joshua said, okay, time to divvy out the land. From the time he was 80 till he was 85, he, 
He fought with Joshua yeah. through the land. I mean, they had to, and, and finally they gathered, and Joshua said, okay, it's time to do what Moses tell us, and Caleb stood for it. He said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Moses told me that every place on which my foot has trod, he's the only one that got that promise, by the way. He's the only one, really. I want that mountain. And we used to sing it with the grapes of that gold rope. Remember that old song? I want that mountain. Yeah. And God said, it's yours. He was 85. And Judah went in. And we're told that in the place of the giants that was the city of Arba, dominated by the demonic, demonic, you know, giant spirits, he went in and he drove them out. I won't have a lot of time, but I just want to throw this in. It was his son-in-law and nephew, Othniel, who married his daughter, who killed them. And maybe as, as a generation of our age, we can drive them out, but it might take a few generations or another generation to actually kill these giants. Okay, Sheshach was the first giant. And his name refers to skin color. Whoa. Ethnicity. I would say race. But I, I, I'm a creation science follower, and, and I say to you, there's only one race. There's only one race on planet Earth, it's the human race. Yeah. Amen? If, if you look at the Apostle Paul at Mars Hill, he says that in Acts 17. We're all from one blood. Yeah. And now the modern microbiologists and geneticists and all the modern science that, that looks into the DNA stuff, they, they said, we all come from a common father and mother. Can you say hallelujah? Yeah. Science now confirms the Bible. And, and I'm telling you, all that Darwinian nonsense is falling away. And in these last days, we're going to see God, God really use that. So here is race and ethnicity as a giant among God's people. It's got to be brought down. Can someone say amen? Yes. And we really need to search our hearts. I mean, when you're raised in, in, in apartheid South Africa, all this stuff, you know, there, there are a lot of things that have to be uh, cleansed out. And, and it's not just the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that can do it. And, and it's not just about skin color or that kind of thing. We're all of one race. I'll give one example. When I was young, Yugoslavia was one country. All right? What? One country. And... Um, Tito was the communist dictator in Yugoslavia. When it, when it, Jesus said, in the last days, nation shall rise against nation. nation. And uh, we're going to see that. And, and, and if you look that up, the meaning means ethnic groups. If you look at Yugoslavia, all those ethnic groups that hated one another, the traditional hatred, Satan is trying to fuel that. Amen? He's really trying to th throw fuel on that fire everywhere. Not just here, but, but now Yugoslavia is six different countries. It's Croatia, and Serbia, and Macedonia. That's just an example. When I was growing up, we, we talked of Czechoslovakia, but the Czechs didn't like the Slovaks and vice versa, you know, and now it's two different countries. You, you see that the world is becoming fragmented and divisive and that's exactly what Satan wants. But what God wants is that we take these giants down and unify. Mm. Amen? Can you say amen to that? It's up to us to take these giants out of our own hearts and, and out of God's people. Amen? The next one, Ahiman, that's a good one. It, it means blood relative. Whoa. Now, I've got to go quickly on this. Sorry. But, uh, you know, you think about it, when I came into the kingdom of God, my mom and dad led, led my late wife and I to Christ. She was a little Jewish lady. And, and uh, we came into the kingdom, and most of the family said, oh, praise the Lord, they came in, you know. And that looked good, but then I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then half of them said, oh man, he's, he's yeah. lost it, you know. <laughs> and, and this separate, you, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, religious stuff. I, I've worked with Muslims who received the Lord 
and their, their family totally disenfranchised them. I've been with African people that tried to get away from all the, you know, the traditional stuff and and uh, and, and ancestral stuff, and, and they, they really face some difficult times, you know. Lord, just drop something to me. Jesus was in a house sharing the word of God. Knock, knock at the door, and they came to Jesus. Said, your mother and your brothers are outside there. You know, your mother and your brothers are outside there. And what did Jesus ask? Who is my mother? Who is my brother but he who does the will of my father? And, and so if, if we let, you know, you know, you, I've heard families say, you just want to be with those church people all the time. And you don't even want to be around your own blood family, you know, who are jawling and, you know, doing all, you know, have you ever heard that? You like those church folks, well, well, they're my family. I've been born into the kingdom of God. Okay, Tom, I, I have to go quickly. I could do a good full sermon now, all these. Yeah. But uh, Tom, I, is your vocation. Whoa. Do you think people's vocation keeps them out of the house of God? Mm. Hello. Yeah. You know? People are becoming obsessed with work. And, and the, the root of it is materialism. The root of it is, is mammon. It's the love of money. You know, I have a chance to do this deal on Sunday. I can't make it. I'll, I'll, I'll get the CD. Or what, you know what I'm saying. Um, how many names, like Smith and Carpenter, and, uh, English names, and, and other countries. Um, my mom's maiden name was Bauer. They were German farmer. You know, they were actually named after their occupation. And, and their occupation was everything. What are you? People say, oh, what are you? Well, I'm a, you know, I'm a teacher. Is that all I am? No. But you understand what I'm saying. And, and I've seen today, especially with opportunity to do all your work online, you know, that, that people are just on airplanes, in restaurants, you know, they're just obsessed with work. And, and I think the greatest idolatry in the Western world has to do with the love of money. Amen? The, the mess we're seeing all, all around us, you know, the big pharma and all that nonsense, it all has to do with the idolatry of the love of money. Yeah. Now we're going to have communion. And I appreciate Len and, and they, they're, they're my... Landlord and my landlady, who could ask for better than that? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, you know, they take this seriously. We all should take it seriously. What does it say? Let a person examine yes. themselves. Yeah. Let us examine. You know, we take stock taking at work, you know, every year and get serious about it. How often as Christians... Do we look into our own hearts? You think God wants to reflect? You know, David all the time, Lord, search me, try me, know my ways. If there's any ethnocentricity, whether it's, you know, has to do with, with, with skin color or, uh, you know, nationality or what, you know? Does God want that giant there? No, we've got to bring him down and we can. We can bring him down. Ah, amen. Yeah. Does, does our blood family pull us away, pull us down? Are, are we bringing them up? Are we displaying the glory of God, sharing the word of God? Or are we, we afraid of offending them? And, being, and do we compromise because of family stuff? Hello? Isn't it beautiful that on Pentecost, Mary was there. She didn't have any special exemption. She had to be in that upper room. The brothers of Jesus, uh, Jude and James, who, who wrote epistles, they were there. Yeah. It was a choice. Amen? Yeah. It's a choice. And, and being related, you know, <laughs> doesn't count for much. <laughs> you know, we have to have our own relationship with God. Yeah. And on that note, you're supposed to go like this and then... 
<laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you, you have spoken. This is very general, very broad, but I, I just thank you that you inspire us to look deeper, yes. even into our own hearts. And, and Father, as we come to the table of God, we thank you that there's always a place for your children at the table of the Lord. Yeah. We thank you that you are faithful and you are just to forgive us yes. of all unrighteousness in, in deed or in thought, Lord. Help us, search us, and know our ways that, that we might gain strength from partaking of, of the body and the blood of Jesus. Yeah. And for this we give you the highest praise and thanks in Jesus' name.